Hello and welcome to Great British Landscapes. Uh, we're here to do a, a video book review, um, quite similar to we did the uh, Peter Dombrovskis Peter Dombrovskis some review months some months ago. Uh, this Our photographer time, this this time is David, David Munch, Munch. <laughs> uh, who hopefully we're featuring as a master photographer in a, a few issues time or a couple of issues time, uh, and an influence on you, I believe. This book. And this is the book we're going to look at uh, today. Uh, was purchased in 1986 in Bryce Canyon National Park, uh, and by my other half, who was it was a present for me. And uh, I can't believe 25 years ago, it's still something I love to look at today. And you can tell from the cover, <laughs> which is got sellotape all over it, and on the inside it's even worse. Yeah. Um, I think the advertiser is worn condition. Seen better days. So we're going to get rid of the cover. Uh, it's a very good quality book, however, so fortunately it has held up very well. Yes. And it is, I hope people will find it very interesting. David Munch is an American photographer. He was the son of a German-born American photographer. He has a son who was a photographer, Mark Munch, in his own right. So they are really a uh, dynasty mm, of photographers. And, and David, I think, we believe is the greatest of the three. I think so. So um, uh, let me just start by saying that uh, that in some respects, although I, I, I value all the photographers who you know who we've talked about before, especially Peter Dombrovskis, but I really I realise now, looking back through this book, that really perhaps the primary influence, certainly in terms of uh, large format and colour landscape photography on me, would have been David Munch. And I think when we start looking through this book, uh, hopefully it'll become readily apparent why. Uh, the book, by the way, has got a really nice essay at the front by a gentleman called Patrick O'Dowd, so it's worth having for that reason. And although that's an un, perhaps an unusual place to start with this very, very simple picture, um, but let me go straight in uh, to one of the first spreads. Uh, very primeval, well, as is suggested by the title yes. of this chapter, sorts of pictures uh, of, of wilderness landscapes, or what would appear to be wilderness landscapes. Uh, and Munch's preoccupation in this book is tr is given a form by the publisher uh, as if he were he'd gone out on a, a kind of mission yeah. to discover Americans uh, America's landscape hard but the reality of course is that it's been accumulated over 40 years yes 40 it's a years, retrospective 30, collection years. it is a retrospective they've been organized into seven main chapters uh, which have got a real uh, an artist, very artistic sort of bent. So if we quickly run through that, we'll see that the yeah, very first chapter primeval. is called Primeval. And then we have one that is called Antiquity. There. And a lot of that antiquity is, is around the American, Native American uh, Indians. There's a chapter called Light, which is quite obvious, isn't it? For a, yes. Photographer, landscape photographer. Fairly important. And in, in some respects, what you find, and then form. So these are more photographic concerns, perhaps, than anything to do with America specifically. Space. But these are all concepts, very, very important concepts for, for any enthusiastic photographer. Motion. A lot of moving water in these. Mm. Renewal. I think that's it. So there's a sort of nominal chapters but actually once you get into them it really is a seamless progression of of wonderful landscape photographs which may or may not uh, have that particular stamp on them if we give the audience a little bit of context this book was published in did we look at it in 1980 1984 84 uh, and he was born in 1936 so that would make him about 48, I believe. Was it? Or is it 58? Um, 58. My maths never been very good. 46, 46, 56, 66. There you go. Yes, Which are, 48. Yes, yeah. So, uh, um, a rem well, remarkably uh, a, a accomplished photographer from a young age. I mean, he was literally out with his dad, yeah. you know, very, very early doors. But I think your point really is the age of the book and the reproduction quality of the book, we cannot ever get away from that. We look at, at yeah. pictures now. All these pictures predate digital. Uh, they predate digital repro as yes. well. So the the four color process it has changed a lot since this book was pr was printed, and I think we can see some of that. But having said that, the quality of the printing is very good. 
mm. for a book of, of this type. Uh, and it predates Fuji Valve, as we were discussing earlier about the, the rendering of the pictures. We were discussing saturation, which is an article in um, a, a recent issue. And considering all these are pre valve there is still quite a lot of bold colour. Uh, not necessarily in these, but later on we'll see some quite bold shots. And these would have been taken on the Kodachromes or Ectochromes. No, well, uh, actually, almost entirely Ectochrome. Right. And the reason I know that is because during the most uh, of, uh, of his career, there was no large format Kodachrome. Ah, okay. So this right. is all Ectochrome. And I suppose American photographers were, were very loyal you know, to the great yellow father. Kodak. Yes. So uh, I know that from having worked in the States myself. And uh, they, you know, they, I'm sure the, these were predominantly shot on Exochrome. And partly for that reason, I'm also pretty confident, and we'll see more examples of this later, they were, many of them were filtered yes. for colour, not necessarily for gr graduation, which is something that we would very likely do today. To compensate for the inadequacies of the film, mostly. Yeah. Yeah, in some cases, as you'll see, some of those colour casts that yeah. have been introduced are not always favourable. Yeah. But uh, actually, we don't want to concentrate on that too much today, I don't think, because, I, I mean, I'm a great admirer of David Munch, and I think he's uh, too much neglected, uh, certainly elsewhere in the world. I think his, his compositions are almost archetypes for a way of seeing the world that many landscape photographers today use, and certainly which have influenced me. I think this page is a good example. Mm. These, are th these elliptical and spherical forms, for example, are, are motifs that I use frequently. His use of space, of foreground to background, to draw us into the scene through this kind of psychological depth of the picture space yes. is very archetypical. Now, he was not the first photographer to do that, of course. I mean, and nor was Ansel Adams before him, or he goes a long, long way back. But many of these pictures, I think it would be fair to say, are Ansel Adams in colour. Yeah. Uh, only more so. Yeah. Uh, I think he's more graphic in many ways than Ansel Adams, the way he uses, he uses objects extreme. and geology. Yeah, yeah, more extreme. More extreme in the, way, in the way he uses both the landscape, but also the technology. I think... These, this is almost certainly shot with a 75 millimetre lens on 5x4. That is a super wide. Yeah. Maybe not so much. And would, would those lenses have been available for a long time in a large format? This, uh, 75 mil is probably the equivalent of about ooh, um, 18 mil, 19 yeah. millimetre, something yes, like that. Yes, it would be. And on 35 mil. Yeah. Uh, and yes, they've been available for a good many years. Um, yeah. the, the best Schneider and Nikkor and Rodenstock designs didn't really come in until the 80s, but there were. Uh, 65s and 75s available yeah. back in the late 60s, I believe, if not before. And he may well also have used American lenses. The Kodak made some fabulous large format lenses uh, in, in the early days. So they tended to be quite slow, but many of them were very, very good quality. So The colour on this is slightly odd, so I think we'll skip past this skip one. Skip that one. Yeah. yeah, I don't understand that at all. Some of these images have very subdued, very, very kind of sensitive colour palettes, um, very naturalistic. I think the rendering... Sorry, the, I was going to say the example of, of the bold use of the wide-angle lenses there. I've, I've not seen many photographers before that point using this very uh, bold foreground, using the uh, scale I agree. and tilt. Uh, and that, uh, I would say, is archi an archetypical Munch image. Mm. Um, you can see images by Galen Roll and Jack DeKinger and many others who've, who've followed, as it were, in his footsteps that use similar, a similar approach today. Uh, I mean, I've certainly made images with this style of composition. Um, I can think of many, many American photographers who use it. The wildflowers in, in, you know, in the alpine meadows of the Rockies, particularly, it's a, yeah. it's, a, it's a classic. And I think Munch got there first. But of course, he wasn't the first person to know how to use tilt on, on the view camera. No. Perhaps the first person, though, if you think of Elliot Porter as being an innovator in colour photography, we don't see many pictures of Elliot's of this style. No. Uh, and, and I think I think Munch really was perhaps an innovator in that res in respect. Many, in many ways, Elliot was the sort of deadpan photographer. So to Munch is quite dramatic. Yeah. Having said that, that's a more Porter-esque uh, use of the lens. And an example of how there's quite a large amount of saturation for old films and old, old printing Well, can you this. believe that he photographed that with no filter? Because I can't. I mean, I'm absolutely yes. certain... It has a nice natural colour rendering with, with strong yellows. Absolutely confident that he used an 81 series, maybe even an 85 series 
filter to take the blue cast out of this photograph. Yeah. Uh, but the result is very nicely balanced. He didn't always achieve that, as we'll see later. But there's a very, very accomplished technician, without, without a doubt. This picture, particularly these two, but especially this one, seems to suggest Dombrovskis, does yes. it not? I think Peter Dombro Dombrovskis' great myrtle tree the picture. The myrtle tree picture, one of my favourites. Yeah. Is, it, it is very much falls into, into this sort of bracket. Lovely mood, wonderful, rich presence of the trees there, and well-managed colour. Now, would Dom Dombrovskis have been contemporaneous to, if this was in the early 80s? Yes, yeah, a good question. I think David Munch uh, precedes him, yeah. although the, Munch is still alive today. Uh, Peter would have been 65 by now yeah. if he'd been alive. Uh, so it would have been perhaps 15, 15 So he, he may have been influenced by these. More this, likely, this certainly than the other way around. Yeah. yeah. Very minimal use of, of colour here. And it's interesting how we tend to associate America and Americans with sunshine. But the best colour photographers, well, there, there's sunshine for you, yes. uh, will, will also always tend to work well in soft light. There's a spot, spot how that was taken. That is, that's always baffled me, this picture. But I'm absolutely certain it's a double exposure. This is quite innovative. And I think he was very creative, even though large format, you know, it's, it's quite a restrictive way of working. Yeah. This, I'm absolutely confident, has got no relationship with Photoshop whatsoever because it predates it. So it's made in camera. Yes. A close-up and a distant vista combined in one composition. Very cleverly done. So we have the feeling they probably masked the camera, masked the camera on the first shot, to get the drawings, and then the, the second shot was probably black in the top anyway. So. So. But what we don't know is what the relationship was of this uh, this graf piece of graffiti um, to uh, the the distant landscape. I'm, I'm sure they must have been shot fairly close to one another yeah. for them to come up with the idea. But I, I, I just think that is a stunning piece of creativity. Well, presumably, they must have been sequential. You, you would know, think so. In well, order yeah, to do it in camera, for sure, exactly. This spread actually is a very interesting example of two very successful pictures, but which I think by our, our judgment today look a little bit heavy on the filter side. Mm. Uh, and I think this is a, consequences, a consequence of using a warming filter, come what may in most situations, because you know you're likely to get a more effective result with it. And especially ectochrome used to go this rather cyanic blue, yeah. which uh, I think is, is very, very cold. and emotionally quite cold. However, this image, which has got lovely warm lighting, I suggest is too warm, uh, perhaps it loses something as a result. I think the, the problem with um, real filters, when you, when you apply a filter in or, or a warming or a cooling in Photoshop, you don't tend to affect the highlights and shadows. But when you apply a, a, a real filter, a gel filter or a resin filter, it affects everywhere. So your, your highlights in the clouds will go orange as well. And I think that's where a lot of the pictures have that you're ahead of me on that one. Yeah, I'm sure that that is very likely true. Yeah. But that, maybe that, that's another article, isn't it? Hey? But but these this spread, for example, shows a wide colour range in, in both images, and they're very naturalistic. And one thing that uh, I, I know I feel looking at Munch's pictures is that overall, in spite of the occasional colour discrepancy, there's a naturalism to the way that the tones are rendered, perhaps more so than today, where there's an there's a tendency to uh, we're all familiar with HDR and uh, sometimes the baleful <laughs> results that, that come from that, but also the good results, yes. which allow us to manage shadows in a, 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 and highlights in a very controlled way. He didn't have that, that option. And, and yet the mastery of technique that he had with exposure and, and all his camera uh, technique, uh, tilts and perspective control and so on, enables him to produce excellent results and very naturalistic, I think. This, this one is interesting because I think perhaps by today, I feel anyway, looking at a picture of the Grand Canyon, uh, which is a rather over-photographed subject perhaps, that this one loses a little by the loss of shadow detail. But on the other hand, he's got this lovely suggestion of rim and shadow in the foreground. And the way he uses that compositionally, I think, is, is, is stunning. And there's a flow to the I way that the light that, that uh, does seem to be a sort of bowl, bowl shaped effect from the highlights. And there's but, a there's an yeah. overall you often find with much images that there's a, a very much a grand gesture in in the compositional um, structure. So while they're full of rich details, there's always a strong motif yes. 
Yeah. And in this case, it's in the, you know, the totality of the landscape in the way that the highlights are drawn across the composition and the way that the cloud is, is structured in the composition as well. It, it is inevitable, and we're having to literally go through spread by spread and seek out uh, particular images which really jump out. This is an interesting uh, spread because I think that, that this is quite brave, unusual, no sky, no mm -hmm. reference to that, but a, a, a composition that depends on its impact uh, for this sort of steepling perspective. And he's using these, you know, this little shadowed hole uh, to correspond uh, to, uh, and they're not kivas, but they are uh, ancient dwellings there. Um, does it say where it is? Chaco culture, which is New Mexico. Um, very difficult place to photograph, by the way. It's because of the light, or? I think so. Um, the, the landscape there is not as, as uh, say, spectacular as at Canyon de Chez or at the uh, Navajo National Monument in Colorado. So there's a, it's a different kind of picture that has to be made, and, and he rises to the challenge. And I think here, too, this is uh, Taos, which has become a little commercial perhaps since, but instead of using the super wide, which he's reached for here, he's got the long lens using, again, using photographic is, is you know, comfort with uh, traditional photographic techniques to create a different kind of composition. Yeah. Uh, this Repetition wonderful. of shapes is wonderful, isn't it? Yeah, and uh, obviously they ha they refer to the distant hills and uh, and, and with the uh, adobe dwellings in the middle distance. And this whole chapter is devoted to the subject of uh, you know the old old um, you know tribes of uh, of, Amer of the Americans before you know predating Europe. And you photographed here. I have Canyon yeah. de Chez, yeah. uh is a really interesting location. Ansel Adams photographed there. Yes. Timothy O'Sullivan. Uh, it was perhaps the place that I knew for sure for the first time that I wanted to be a landscape photographer. I looked out over this rock wall, saw this little Anasazi dwelling, but the, yeah. the sheer drama of, of the rock and the beauty of it, it's both painterly and sculptural simultaneously, inspired the thought in my mind that nature always excelled, always exceeded what the artist could create, be they architect, painter, uh, sculptor or whatever. And I, I realised at that moment that actually being a landscape photographer, you go and see the natural world and, and man's interaction with it, looking at these, and, and, and simply be a, a, a faithful witness. That was good enough for me. That, that was a, a moment for me. Here we have it again, the Canyon de Chez. And this is a very bold well, composition. Fantastic picture. Very, very bold. Again, All using the, lines and yeah. shape. Yeah. Very, very graphic, as you say. Yeah. Rightly so. I don't know whether his, he has uh, any formal training. Uh, in the arts, or whether it's, it's simply come from having a, a photographic father, you know, and this great passion for the American West and a very sensitive eye. So we are moving on to light. Uh, actually, it's funny, isn't it? I think White Sands, New Mexico, that's definitely about light, but yes. then everything else, well, it's just as much about, about colour, which of course is, is all part of light. I'm going to keep moving here. Very saturated colours in some of these images, even with this sort of more traditional way of printing 25-year-old book. I don't see many silhouettes used like that very often. I'm not sure whether the cameras have naturally got too much dynamic range for it. Or well, that, I think that's an interesting point. But, you yeah. know, he's made a virtue of the photographic process here. I suspect that he, David Mudge, standing in this place, would have seen shadow detail in the arch. Yes. He's made no attempt to... And how could he have done? You know, it's yeah. right into the light. And actually, just a bold use of shape. You know, literally this, this shape here. Wonderful shapes, simple shapes, and then black. It's almost... Very, very hard to make dead black work, but I think it does there. That's one of my favourites, even though the, the, the strange colours in the shadows there, what you're going, almost Still violet colours. Still yeah. works, yeah. Very, very Fantastic sense of light. Brilliant use of light and, uh, and very, very graphic. I suspect that the colour cast in this image is a typical use of an 81 filter, mm. plus 81D, I would guess, uh, and, and you, you end up with a slightly magenta look. Which, of course, today we would, you know, we could change in Photoshop if we wished. In a way, that's one of the kind of refreshing aspects of looking at a book like this. I believe we're seeing something that's really very close to the transparencies, and we have little doubt that there's not much intervention yeah. in that sense. And I think, in that sense, too, you can see the mastery of his technique. I'm glad we've got to this spread, because although this picture is rather small, this is one of my favourite David Munch photographs of... Um, 
it's yeah, the Dead Horse Point view uh, in in Canyonlands. It's actually just outside Canyonlands National Park. Um, I've actually stood in that position myself, trying to recreate this composition and failing yeah. appallingly. Um, was but, that when you were using large format as well? Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah. It was, and I, I, I had. A, why did I try? You know, you, I know. I've, I've, I tell you know people that you know never try and recreate what somebody else has done. Well, at least not if you're a you know ambitious photographer, because you know you create your own piece. Yeah. But my admiration for, for him and my, I've actually stood in his footsteps on a number of occasions. That is one of those places, and I, I think our view of some of these locations. You know, he, he, like Ansel Adams before him, has very much determined what we expect. I think if mm. you had a Torah Week point here, yes. that's the picture yeah. that you carry um, in your you, mind. You see many pictures like of, of Torah Week. Yes. I'm not sure many is good, but... No, I don't think so. Yeah. No, I, I think there's something that's, that's a, a more predictable view of the mittens, perhaps, although clever with the moon. But the, this Torah Week picture is very, very atmospheric. It's very technically flawed, actually. If you look at the at the burnt out sort of sky, but it's got a wonderful mood to it, quite soft light, and a feeling of freshness about the composition, which perhaps you know other photographers have lost because they've seen this picture already. That's one I'm not so keen no. on. Um, that that really looks like the CMYK four color process yeah, taken it's a test shot. to the max. Let's move on. That's quite dramatic light. Very dramatic. And That's both, without filtration, obviously. Yeah, I think so, in both these cases. This is a, a landscape which is very controversial, by the way. I don't know if you've been there. Uh, it's, it's a result of a dam, I presume. It is, yeah, Lake, Lake Powell. Uh, right in the heart of, of the Colorado uh, um, plateau area. Uh, and written about at length by Edward Abbey, the great environmentalist writer, American writer. Uh, it's used by many Americans and enjoyed because it's a, as well as being a, a dam generates um, hydropower. Uh, it is uh, a, a great place of recreation, but it's a totally unnatural environment. Yes. One thing that looking at that I'm struck by is the thought, how much, if at all, did he ever use a graduated filter? Yes. And, and my guess is at this stage in his career, he may not have had access to them. I was going to say, I'm not, I'm, I tried to look at the history of graduated filters at one point, and I couldn't find any reference to them very much, apart from Cokin, which would probably be in the, in the 80s. Mm, late 70s, late I think. 70s. Uh, but they were very much presented as effects filters and not for serious photographers. Yeah. But I do know from conversations with Jack Dikinger that uh, Jack used uh, just a dark slide to dodge the sky, right. uh, hold back the sky on some of his images, and very likely uh, David Munch could well have used the same thing. Of course, American landscape photographers, that wonderful, uh, do, I mean, it, actually, it's quite a predictable picture now, but I think I'm sure he was the first to come up with that mm -hmm. idea, uh, do have much, generally much brighter the, in the desert southwest with the sand and the bright rock it's perhaps less of a problem for them to balance the sky. Because light, the light's being bounced off the light land. And the blue sky is quite deep because they're at altitude and there's a scattering and so on and so forth. But even so, there's still light balancing mm. to be done. Many of his compositions are, are very intimate, uh, and very graphic, and like that one there. And yet he's also got huge grandeur looking miles into the distance, such as here at Mount Hayden. You know, here, and this is Death Valley, and Mesquite Dunes. So... They're very classic too, aren't they? When you're looking at them now, you think, gosh, he's been to every single yeah. uh, standout location in the American landscape. This must be the Hawaiian volcanoes. Yeah. Yep. Pahio lava. There's a figure in there. Can you see that? Oh, human, yeah. human sort of figure. And, and, and here also, this is uh, Bristlecone Pines. This is in Nevada. So this isn't a well-known spot, but... Um, this is very much an icon of the American West, the bristlecone pine, the oldest living tree on the planet, of which, of course, there are thousands. And interestingly, this very soft light composition is at Point Lobos, which is a place that Edward Weston kind of immortalised in his photography. This, this looks more like an Elliot Porter almost-esque shot, doesn't it? In colour palette, yeah, particularly, yeah. and in a way that it, it, it's rendered, yes, very interesting picture and such a contrast to this very active seascape shot presumably at a 500th of a second 
Yes. These waves pounding off the uh, rocks in the distance.